Okay, good morning. Where do we leave off? We had discussed COPD, how it progresses, what it means. Today in lab and in this class uh, prior to, we are going to discuss how we assess not only COPD, but lung function in general. So one of the ways that you might be familiar with to assessing lung function is shown here. This is a Bell spirometer. This is um, what you would use to measure static lung volume. Here you have a person whose lungs are essentially continuous with the spirometer. This is a closed system. And when they breathe in, they breathe in air from inside the bell of the spirometer. Air goes in, the bell drops. Because this is on a pulley, the bell drops means that the, uh, the pen on the rotating drum moves upwards and it draws a line. So every upwards line indicates inspiration. And then when they breathe out again, they're putting air back into the bell. The pen drops. And the downwards line means expiration. The water is only here to make sure that it's an airtight seal. If it doesn't get changed, it gets pretty ugly. We don't use these very often anymore. We simply have them on hand to show you this is what we used to do. Now we have real-time airflow sensors that will measure flow and calculate volume without you having to breathe into a closed system and then back out again, in and out, in and out, to something that someone else has probably done the same thing with prior. We have reusable um, and new filters, different mouthpieces that are much more hygienic. But this is how we would have measured static lung volumes in the past. Static lung volumes. Every time you breathe in and out, you get a sense of how much air was moved. This drum rotates at a certain rate, and so you'll have an idea of how much time has passed, but we don't have an idea of how quickly that air was moved unless we do some calculus. So a trace that you might get after the drum completes a full revolution, there's paper taped to the outside. You would take the paper off, lay it flat on the desk. It would be something like this. Inspiration, expiration. Inspiration, expiration. And this small band in the middle is indicative of tidal volume. If your subject took a massive breath inwards, they would reach their um, total lung capacity. The difference between tidal volume and total lung capacity is the inspiratory reserve volume how much uh, space you have available to tap into if you need to take a deep breath. The complement to that is the expiratory reserve volume, how much air you can breathe out of your lungs at any given point in time if it's warranted. Uh, all of those things together are the vital capacity. The vital capacity does not match the total lung capacity because there's some residual volume in the lungs. They never fully deflate, which is good because alveoli and alveolar sacs, when they deflate and compress, it's hard to reinflate them. So we always keep some residual volume of air inside the lungs. Now with COPD, if you were to have a person compared to this normal trace, a person with COPD would likely not show a change in tidal volume. This band down the middle would probably look pretty similar. One thing that might be different about tidal volume <coughs> is its place within the vital capacity. Often, residual volume is higher, and so this band is pushed upwards. People with COPD tend to breathe higher in the lung. The immediate implication of that is if they have to take a deep breath, they have a higher residual volume, they compress the inspiratory reserve volume, they don't have as much space available to take a deep breath if they need to. Inspiratory reserve volume is decreased. So inspiratory reserve volume is decreased. I apologize, my pointer seems to be dying. Expiratory reserve volume is also decreased. If they need to take a deep breath in, 
they don't have as much capacity, they need to expel a lot of air, they can't do so as adequately as a healthy person. Their total, uh, their vital capacity then is decreased as a whole, residual volume is often half of total lung capacity in these uh, patients with progressed or severe COPD. So residual volume can be very high in these individuals. The uh, functional space of the lungs is severely decreased. It's hard to tell from a trace like this if a person has COPD or not, or if there's some uh, blockage in the airway, or how severe it is. The trace might be shifted, but the lines would look somewhat similar. We can get a sense based on if it's compressed or not, but we have no way of really identifying those patients with COPD, nor do we have a way to identify flow rate, air flow, the functional measure of lung, um, lung ability, the ability to move air in and out. So we use dynamic functional tests to evaluate COPD and other obstructive and restrictive pulmonary pathologies. And those are two terms that I will introduce and we'll discuss at length today, obstructive and restrictive pulmonary pathologies. COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, is the former. It's an obstructive disorder. Restrictive disease is um, when lung volume has been reduced for whatever reason. The volume is restricted. Obstruction simply means that flow is impeded. There might be um, smaller airways or growth within the airways, so the movement of air is obstructed. Total lung volume is unchanged. Restrictive means lung volume is changed, whereas there might not be an obstruction in the airway. That will become clear as we go through the class today. So what does this dynamic functional testing look like? We saw it in the video at the end of last class person hooked up to a much more sanitary mouthpiece with the uh, handheld device that can measure flow. And as they breathe through that device and flow is registered, the amount of time that passes is used to calculate volume, all done by a recording device or a computer. And this is very similar to what you'll do in lab today. So we have the uh, metabolic cart set up that allows us to do uh, something very similar. You've used the mouthpiece with the headgear before in XFIS. Same exact setup to this spirometric testing in lab. So from this maneuver, we'll talk about how we do it properly. From this maneuver, what do we get? The most common test that you want to perform is the forced vital capacity test. And this trace should look familiar. This is very similar to the trace we generated with the Bell spirometer two slides ago. This is volume over time. Every upwards deflection is a breath in, downward deflection is air moving out. And what we've shown here is a change from normal tidal breathing to the forced vital capacity test. What is it to do a forced vital capacity test? It's outlined really nicely in your lab manual. But in brief, a person from a normal, uh, normal tidal breathing will take a maximal inspiration completely fill their lung volume, and then breathe everything out as quickly as they can. Everything out as quickly as they can. And you don't often do that. If you ever blow air out of your lungs quickly, you might be whistling or trying to blow out candles or something, and your, your mouth is uh, the bottleneck. It creates a small hole. Here, this is the opposite. This is, say the, like the word ha. <sighs> Everything out of your breath or out of your lungs as quickly as you can. Air almost falls out of your lungs. And it's a really weird sensation, especially if you do it a couple times. When I was making the lab manual, I had to test out how the uh, software would work. And I did maybe 10 or 12 of these in a row. And then all of your intercostals start to hurt because you never really use your intercostals like that, ever. It's uh, an odd sensation. You might have that happen today, we'll see. So forced vital capacity, maximum breath in, 
expel everything as quickly as you can, and the difference between those two points is forced vital capacity. So in this example, forced vital capacity is uh, taking these two volumes, taking these two blocks and adding them together. On maximum inspiration, I have five liters of air in, uh, in my lung over and above tidal volume. After expiration, I've gotten rid of an extra half a liter. So the difference between those two is 5.5 liters. That's the vital capacity I was able to expel. So if you're a purist like me, I'll just put this up here. I don't want to confuse you, but the difference between two points more correctly should be final minus initial. Or in other words, the final endpoint is minus 0.5 liters minus the initial starting point, which is 5 liters. You simply do the arithmetic. It's negative 5.5 liters, and a lot of people are scared by negative symbols, but that simply means out. The negative symbol means 5.5 liters left the body, final minus initial. That uh, indicates directionality. So it's the difference between these two points. The correct arithmetic way is shown second, but doing it the first way is fine as well. What we don't know from this trace is whether or not the person expelled air as quickly as they could. We have no concept of flow rate. We have volume and we have time. If we're watching the person, it might look like they've done a maximal exhale, but you could make this trace breathing really slowly. I could take a maximal breath in and go, breathe out slowly for 30 seconds, I'm still emptying my lungs, until I end up at the same point. I could create this exact same graph, but just draw it out a lot more. If that's the case, I've performed what's called a slow vital capacity test, where forced requires maximal effort. We need large flow rates. It has to be obvious the person is breathing out as quickly as they can. That's the only way that we can, we can um, conduct a successful forced vital capacity test. Slow vital capacity is anything slower than maximal. The numbers would be the same. They would simply be compressed or expanded, and flow rate will be different. We'll look at flow very shortly. I'm easing you into this concept with a graph that looks familiar. It's easy to wrap your head around what volume does over time. The difference between those two points is forced vital capacity if the person breathes out as quickly as they can. Another measurement that we looked at or saw referenced quickly in the video at the end of last class was forced expiratory volume in one second, or FEV1. Forced expiratory volume in one second. So what would that look like in the trace that we just put up on the last slide? This is the exact same trace. Forced vital capacity is still listed here. It's unchanged. It's 5.5 liters. What would FEV1 look like on this trace? FEV1 starts at the instant the expiration begins. Let's say for argument's sake, it's five seconds into the test. As soon as the direction of the air changes, it goes from moving inwards to turning around and moving outwards, the stopwatch begins. And exactly one second after that start point, we need to take another measurement. If we begin at five seconds, the end of that measurement ends at exactly six seconds. What are we measuring? We are measuring the change in volume, the fraction of the expired volume in one second, which we've defined here. So if we start, again, at five liters, same starting point, what we need to be able to figure out is what is the volume at six seconds? Well, you could time it exactly, draw the line up to reach the curve, and then trace it over to the y-axis and figure out what the volume is. And because this is 
an example, it conveniently happens to be exactly one liter. In one second, I've exhaled four liters, the FEV1 in this case, five uh, minus one, being four liters expelled in the first second of the test. You won't make this measurement or do this calculation with this graph. And you probably won't do this calculation at all. The, the computer will do it for you. It is difficult to time exactly one second. It is also difficult to know how much, to, to make a volume measurement at exactly that one second. So the computer does this all for you. It will tell you what FEV1 is just in a printout, one band on the printout screen. But you understand what it means when it shows you FEV1 of 3.5 liters or 4.2 liters. It's the amount of air you were able to get out in one second. Usually, we get out most of the air in one second. 75, 80% of the air in your lungs can be expelled in one second. That's what I mean by that sensation of air falling out of the airways. It just goes. And then you have to really squeeze the smaller airways and wring the lungs out to get everything else out over the last 20 seconds of the test. Well, 29 seconds of the test, technically. That's one thing I forgot to uh, mention on the last slide. You breathe out as forcefully as you can, as much as you can, for, th yeah, 30 seconds. I think that's right. I don't want to mislead you. 30 seconds, which is a long time. It sounds ridiculous now that I think about it. It's been a long time since I've done one. No, it's 30 seconds. So FEV1 is the amount of air you expel in one second. FVC is the total amount of air that you expire during the maneuver. If we compare these two, we get a slightly different uh, view of the function of the lungs. The ratio between these two values essentially says how much of my vital capacity was I able to expel in one second. The FEV1 to FVC ratio tells you how much of my vital capacity was I able to expel in one second. If I line those uh, values up on the same graph, FEV1 we've just calculated is 4 liters, FVC is 5.5 liters, so essentially what's the percentage? What percentage did this person get on their test? They got 4 out of 5.5, or 73%. 73% of their lung volume was expired in one second, normal is 70 to 85%, and it varies based on lung strength, the person's stature or size, how big your thoracic cavity is, how big your lungs are, whether there's an obstruction, um, and we can use that information to help understand the functioning of their lungs and where there might be an impediment. So what we're looking at here are the volume versus time traces but we've talked a lot about flow rate, so we're gonna start thinking in terms of flow coming up. Force vital capacity, FEV1, FVC, these are all somewhat normal values, and they'll all be reduced with COPD, with obstruction. They don't have as much lung capacity to work with. Because there's an obstruction, air moves slower. They don't breathe out as quickly, so less air comes out in one second, and the amount or the ratio is also reduced in patients with COPD. So we can use these characteristics when we do a test to understand, well, do you have a problem and how advanced is it? We have normal values that we can compare to. Unsurprisingly, those normal values change and they differ, again, based on lung strength and stature and size. They differ between sexes. And this is a general trace of how these values change over time as well. With advancing age, you generally have reduced lung function, possibly because the elastic tissue starts to wear, or maybe you've accumulated some um, chronic bronchitis or some degree of COPD in your later years. 
But overall, normal data is shown here. We have forced vital capacity, the solid line. The dashed line is FEV1, which we've just talked about. The dotted line is something new. FEF is the forced expiratory flow. <coughs> forced expiratory flow and the 25 to 75 percent listed there indicates it's looking at the middle of the range and I'll show you um, a, a picture a depiction of what that looks like coming up but this measures the average flow rate in the middle of the maneuver 25 percent of um, the expiration all the way to 75%, that middle section, the forced expiratory flow is the average flow rate of air. Notice the units are slightly different. They're all plotted on the same axis. And notice that the peak for all these values occurs around 20 years old. After puberty, at the height of your development, all these values seem to peak. Um, they have a progressive decline with age, so after their peak at 20 years old, it's all downhill from there. Forced expiratory flow. Okay, good. It did have that up there. I wasn't sure that it had this uh, this point showing, but it was the uh, average airflow during the middle portion of the forced vital capacity maneuver. So peak at 20 years, progressive decline over time, and just a separation between men and women. Men tend to have a larger thorax, bigger lungs, a wider stature than women do, and there's just a physical limitation or physical difference, I suppose, between sexes. One of many biological differences. So let's, um, let's look at how we would um, transform our understanding of volume versus time into flow rate versus time. What might our, might our graphs look like that we'll see in lab today? And how might those traces change from a healthy <coughs> to a compromised individual? So healthy, for all intents and purposes, we're looking at someone in the 20 to 30 year old range. For a compromised individual, we can look outwards of 70 years and or someone with full blown COPD. So what does it look like when we do this forced vital capacity maneuver? And what I'm showing you here are traces of the same maneuver. So each pair of lines, top and bottom, are the same maneuver. The solid black lines are from the same person doing the same test. The dashed red lines are from the same test. The dotted black lines from the same test. The difference between top and bottom is that we're looking at Flow versus volume on the top. This is a new graph that we haven't seen yet. And then volume versus time on the bottom, which is the traces that we've been looking at so far this morning. So maybe let's start there. Volume versus time during a forced vital capacity test. Remember, we start with a maximum inhale and then breathe out all the air that we can. So this bottom graph, if you focus on the solid line, is showing you how much air has been expired during the test. We have this rapid increase. Most of the air is expelled in the first few seconds, and then a gradual rounding off until it feels like there's no extra air being expired. And you're gonna feel like you're squeezing and squeezing and nothing is coming out, and it's close to nothing coming out. But this is showing you how much volume has been expired over time. We understand what that trace should be like. That doesn't tell us about how the air moved. To get that information, we need to go to the top graph. The solid line on the top graph shows us how flow changes with volume. Initially, on the left-hand side, no volume has been exhaled. And our lungs are static. They're poised. They're ready to push air out, but there's no movement yet. So you start at zero volume and zero flow. But as soon as you start the maneuver, if it's as forceful as you can, you get this spike, this very quick acceleration, a peak flow that gradually tapers off as you squeeze more and more air out of the lungs. 
So this is what a normal trace should look like. A peak followed by a progressive decline over time. The flow rate gradually gets smaller and smaller until there's no more air to move. The other two lines on this trace, I'm going to go into more detail in the next slide if it's not clear, but I want to show you the other two lines represent the two different um, types of compromised lung function that you might observe. Let's start with the obstructive disease, which is characteristic of COPD, the dotted black line. With an obstructive disease, the airways are smaller, there's something blocking airflow, airflow can't move as quickly. So on the bottom graph, we see not this rapid expelling of air, we see a more gradual compressed trace. Air still is expired in the same volume in this case, but it's just done so slowly. On the top graph, we see that as a lower peak flow. Air can't move as quickly. We reach a lower peak flow that again still tapers off until we reach um, maximal lung volume. In COPD, the trace would look a little bit different uh, with a pure obstruction only with the same size lungs, peak flow is compromised only. With a restrictive disease, where you might have fibrosis in part of the lung, or they talked in the video about removing dead lung tissue, that would be a restrictive scenario. The volume of your lungs is smaller. If the volume of your lungs is smaller, you can't breathe out as much air during the FVC test. On the bottom graph, we see that as, well, the airways that are there function normally, aren't obstructed. We get quick uh, expiration of air from the lungs, but there isn't as much air to expire. Our lung volume is restricted, and so the dashed red line sits lower than the other two lines. On the top graph, the restrictive pattern where lung volume is smaller, but the airways that are there work well, demonstrates a very similar high flow rate initially that drops off more quickly because we reach our total lung capacity faster. So obstructive disease is one that concerns itself or that, uh, that impacts movement of air, the ability for air to move quickly, not the amount of air. Restrictive disease impacts the amount of air, not the ability for air to move quickly. So that's an important point. Destructive impacts airflow, not volume. Restrictive impacts volume and not airflow. You will get used to looking at these top graphs uh, a lot. That's what we, uh, we generate in lab, this flow versus volume trace. And more often than not, we won't even limit ourselves to looking at the, uh, the expiratory portion only. What gives us a really nice complete view of lung function are what we call flow volume loops, or FVL for short, flow volume loops. And a lot of that information is shown here. I'll walk through how we, uh, how we look at it exactly, what those values and acronyms mean. Uh, but this initial trace is the same as the top graph on the last slide. This is flow rate versus volume. You see that initial peak maximal flow that gently tapers off as we expel air from the lungs. That peak expiratory flow is an important measure for assessing normal lung function. Peak flow will often tell us about 
the large airwaves in the lungs. Heat flow on the order of 10 liters per minute indicates that there's no obstruction in the large airways. Air falls out of the trachea, the bronchi, primary and secondary. The big airways give up air quickly. There's very little resistance to flow. We have peak flow that gradually decreases over time. I'm going to come back to the, the FEFs, the fraction of expiratory flow, in a second. But I want to point out the other value that we know well. So there's two values over on the right-hand side that we know well. FVC is the amount of air expired. And there's no question that when you reach um, zero on flow rate and all the volume has been expired, the, uh, the amount shown on the x-axis is force vital capacity. But FEV1 and the other FEV measures are difficult because you can't place them on this graph intuitively. You couldn't take data and say, well not data, you couldn't go to this graph and say, I know FEV1 to be here. There's no time component on this graph, so you can't draw it in unless it's given to you. If you knew the, um, the flow rate at FEV1, you might be able to go in and say, okay, well, the only time that we reach that flow rate is at this time point. That must be FEV1. But FEV1 will be given to you by the computer on the flow volume loop. In this case, FEV1 is about 4 liters, just over 4 liters. The amount of air expired in one second is the yellow dot in the middle. FEV one half is the amount of air expired in half a second. You'll see as I take away the bottom, there's an FEV three, the amount of air expired in three seconds. And uh, we don't care so much about those. FEV one is the, uh, uh, the normal, the standard value that we can use to uh, assess lung function. So FEV one is placed there by the computer. You won't be able to place it on your own because there is no time component here. The other information that we get from this detailed trace is how air moves in the middle of the maneuver. We know peak flow tells us about the large airways. If we can understand how air is moving as it, um, as it wanes, as flow drops down, we can get some information about the smaller airways in the lungs. And that's where the fraction of expiratory flow comes in. Fraction of expiratory flow, we saw a couple slides ago, measuring the average airflow in the middle portion of the maneuver. What each of these points represents is the flow rate at a certain percentage of the maneuver. So let's take the FVC maneuver as a whole along the bottom. And I've drawn in this rectangle to show you this is the entire forced vital capacity maneuver. This is 100% of the maneuver. Well, a quarter of that, 25%, is, is uh, shown here. If I take 25% of the maneuver and then I try to figure out what was the flow rate at that point in time, I could draw a line up to meet the expired line. And uh, over on the left-hand side, that's my uh, forced expiratory flow one quarter of the way in. Here it's just under eight, it's 7.5-ish liters per second. A quarter of the way into the maneuver, air was moving at 7.5 liters per second. And I can do this 50% of the way, 75% of the way, the FEV 25 to 75 that we saw on the last slide is the average airflow between these two points, between the FEF25 and the FEF75, the average airflow between those two points. So it tells us about what's going on with this portion of the graph, and that will become important on the next slide. In a normal, healthy individual, it should drop pretty linearly. What makes this a loop? So far, this is nothing new. It's a loop if we also assess inspiratory function. 
So the FVC maneuver will often be accompanied or followed immediately by a maximum inhale. We've assessed the ability of the lungs to force out air completely. <coughs> we have all the information on flow rate, how much air was expelled, how the flow rate changed over time from the top half of the graph. The bottom half of the graph, where flow is negative or flow is opposite, simply indicates that air is moving in the other direction. If it's moving out on the top, then it's moving in along the bottom. And the trace looks a little bit different here. It's more rounded, but the maneuver is still a maximum inhale. A maximum inhale, the, lung uh, the rib cage lifts, the diaphragm drops, negative pressure is created, and then air moves passively. Any idea why we don't see a spike in flow on this lower portion of the graph? Why would a maximum inhale not move air as quickly as a maximum exhale? Same lungs, same muscles. What's different about moving air out on top versus moving air in on the bottom? Give it a try. Yeah. Okay. Normally, you're absolutely right. Normally, that's, that's true. In a resting situation, you do meter the amount of contraction of your diaphragm. You meter the inhale. But this specific maneuver is meant to be as quickly as you can, as full as you can. So you're trying. You're trying to take the safeties off. And you breathe in as quickly as you can. As quickly and as much as you can. Why can't I move air as quickly? Or why does the flow rate not spike as high on the intake versus the output? If it were resting, I agree with her point. But this is maximal. We want to move it as quickly as possible. The, uh, the answer, it's kind of tricky, yeah. The answer comes from that air moves passively in and actively out. And what I mean by that is when air is in your lungs and you contract all of the intercostals and your diaphragm, all of your muscles of breathing to force air out, you compress that air. There's a confined space, you compress the air, and it essentially <laughs> slingshots the air out of the lungs. You're forcing air out. As you breathe in really quickly, you aren't compressing air. You're not moving air actively. You're just creating a pressure gradient that allows air to move in passively. You're not forcing it in. It's moving in according to the gradient. So there is no spike in flow. You're not compressing and accelerating the air. You're allowing it to move in by creating more space, which is why this has a much nicer, more round uh, profile. So on inspiration, peak inspiratory flow is not necessarily a, uh, a measurement of concern. It doesn't really indicate lung function. Instead, we have <coughs> the complementary flow rates at 25, 50, and 75 percent of the maneuver. These are fraction of inspiratory flow, FIF instead of FEF. And you'll notice 25 and 75 often overlap. This flow volume loop, as it's now called, should be, excuse me, should be complete 
it should start and end at the same spot. You can't ever inhale more air than you exhaled if you started from a completely full lung. You can't exhale more air than you inhale if you end at a completely full lung. These should line up really well. And when you do the maneuver in lab, you, uh, you take one sharp breath in to anchor the flow volume loops uh, in space. And I'll show you a trace of one that I generated when I was making up the lab manual to, to help get that point across. So lots of information on this slide. We have a lot of information that can tell us about how air is moving or function of the lungs. This is normal. <coughs> Big peak expiratory flow, gradual decline over time, and a rounded inspiration. What's abnormal? That's what we're looking at on the next slide. So normal airflow on the far left, peak represents airflow through the large airways, very little resistance to flow, air falls out of the lungs, and then we get information from the gradual decline in flow rate uh, about movement through the small airways. The uh, respiratory and terminal bronchioles, the alveolar sacs and ducts, all those small spaces that need to have air squeezed out of them. Where there's more resistance to flow and air doesn't move as quickly. What happens in an individual with a progressive obstruction? With a progressive obstruction within the airways, we're looking at the next two graphs. The next four graphs are all obstructive. They all impact the flow of air somehow. But progressive obstruction characterized by COPD would look uh, like these next two graphs. So from a normal flow volume loop, you'd have this collapse of the, uh, the second, the, the linear portion of the flow volume loop. This collapse, meaning air is moving less quickly through the small airways of the lung. Peak expiratory flow might be the same. It might be somewhat decreased depending on where the obstruction is. But usually with the inflammation of the bronchioles and the accumulation of mucus, there's severe limitation to flow in the small airways. And so we see this rapid upregulation of flow as air falls out of the large airways, and then all of a sudden, air moving out of the small airways is more and more impaired. It moves more and more slowly as you have uh, more highly progressed COPD or an obstructive disease. So Doing this flow volume loop test, this force vital capacity test, we get information based on the shape of this linear portion as to how progressive or how progressed an obstructive disease might be. So you're looking for linear decrease in flow over time. All young healthy adults probably shouldn't have much of a, a collapse on the, uh, the later portion of the test. Older individuals, maybe like myself, might show a bit of an indentation that progressively worsens over time. So this is all due to resistance to flow in the small airways. What happens if you have an obstruction in the large airways? Normally, air moves really well through the large airways. If there's an obstruction in the large airways, then air won't move really well through the large airways. And that is uh, shown in this fourth figure, fixed large airway obstruction, all of a sudden that peak is eroded. If there's a large obstruction in the airways, maybe a, a tumor or a growth of some kind, air is impeded in those large airways, we don't see the same large peak and it's rounded off at the top. You'll also see a flattening of the inspiratory portion as air moves in more slowly because the obstruction in the large airway is preventing that airflow. So a general rounding of the flow volume loop for fixed large airway obstruction. 
Oftentimes, it's not that clean. Sometimes, you can have a, a large airway obstruction that might be engaged or might not. It's variable. These are um, usually growths outside of the airways that might be pressed against the airways during the maneuver. So a variable extrathoracic obstruction, an obstruction or growth that presses against the airways from the outside, might show a shape where peak expiratory flow is not impacted, but then the inspiration is affected. As you breathe in, it engages whatever the obstruction is. Or the opposite might occur. The obstruction might be engaged during expiration only, not during inspiration. So the variable nature is in um, the mixed appearance of the flow volume loop. So I've thrown up um, a couple different scenarios where each of these might occur. A fixed large airway obstruction might be if you have a problem with the, uh, the vocal cords, fusing of the vocal cords, or paralysis of the vocal cords. If your epiglottis isn't as um, maybe as flexible or as, as labile, if it's fixed in place, if it doesn't move out of the way during the maneuver, it's a large airway obstruction edema or collection of uh, water in the, uh, the larynx, the large airways, the impede airflow. Those are characteristic of the fixed large airway obstruction. And then the variable obstructions could be tumors pressing against the trachea. Chondromalacia is a growth of uh, cartilage. Usually it's found in, in joints like the knee, but it could occur in the trachea as well. There's a lot of, a lot of cartilage in the large airways. Uh, granulomatosis is a rare blood disease, and I forget how that impacts the flow volume loop. So let's forget about that one for now. Um, infection and swelling or compression of the trachea for whatever other means, if there's a mechanical compression of the trachea, that could result in variable airway obstruction as well. So those are a couple different options of things that might result in um, those different compromised flow volume loops. What we haven't looked at yet, though, are the, is the last one indicative of a restrictive disease. So far, the first five all deal with flow of air, impeding the flow of air. There's a normal situation in the next two, flow through the small airways is impacted. In the uh, third and fourth one, flow through the large airways is impacted, but the total lung volume is unchanged. And we know that from these graphs because the width of the flow volume loop is the same in each case. The amount of air expired is the same. A restrictive disease limits the amount of air that can be expired. Lung volume is smaller. You have a lobectomy or a cut off part of the lung to remove some fibrosis, some dead lung tissue. Notice those airways that are there work well. Peak expiratory flow is high. There's a general linear decline in flow as you squeeze air out of the lungs. The problem here is that there's not as much air to squeeze. This is a much narrower, thinner flow volume loop. You reach the end of your force vital capacity a lot more quickly with a restrictive disease than with an obstructive disease. So this is one way that we can look at lung function and evaluate where there might be a limitation and what that limitation might be using the flow volume loop. That's not to say that the volume versus time traces aren't useful. If I compare two extremes, in this case on the left, normal lung function, on the right we have full-blown COPD, you have the forced vital capacity test Shown here, we have flow rate versus, um, versus volume, what we spent a lot of time looking at recently. A, a young, healthy individual, it's shown uh, in yellow on the left in the middle, as being fairly robust and linear. 
in a COPD patient, we have a lower peak flow and uh, the, the collapse of the linear portion. Overall, the forced vital capacity test is impaired. But you can also look at how lung volume changes over time. And we're adding in exercise as well to show you how uh, exercise intolerance plays into COPD. So normally, with a healthy young individual, your tidal volume is centered within the range. You're sitting at about 50% of lung volume, which gives you a lot of room to breathe in if you need to, or breathe out if you need to. And then ventilation increases as intensity increases. We've looked at that. The frequency goes up. Tidal volume goes up. And this is what your breathing pattern would look like. The, uh, each breath is more compressed as frequency goes up, and there's more air being moved as tidal volume goes up. This is what we would expect to happen in a healthy individual. Obviously, that's a lot different for a person with COPD. Notice a couple things. Tidal volume sits higher in the lung. That is, inspiratory reserve volume is smaller, or residual volume is larger. Instead of sitting at 50% of lung volume, tidal volume occurs at maybe 70% of lung volume. There's not as much room to breathe in if they need to. <coughs> residual volume increases with intensity. What I mean by that is tidal volume, if it starts out at 60% of lung volume, it moves up as intensity increases. That could simply be because you can't expel all the air you breathe in. As you breathe uh, more quickly, as ventilation increases, the lungs start to fill. And that's going to send a bunch of warning signals to the brain. You're starting to feel out of breath. You're not getting full ventilation of the lungs. Alveolar PO2 is dropping. Also, tidal volume is reduced. The size, top to bottom, of each breath starts to compress. So you're breathing more frequently but you're breathing uh, less air with each breath, and the lungs are starting to fill up. There's not <coughs> renewal of that alveolar air, and so exercise ceases a lot more quickly than in a healthy individual. Notice you don't get nearly as high in intensity as a young, healthy individual. It's so fairly obvious that this is a limitation, but this is what it would look like on paper. Let's take a little break now.